To Formula One now, and Lewis Hamilton will look to extend his record of 92 Grand Prix wins today. First though, he'll have to find a way past Mercedes teammate Valtteri Bottas, who starts on pole for this afternoon's Emilia-Romagna Grand Prix. The Finn edged out Hamilton with Red Bull's Max Verstappen third quickest. Mercedes could win a seventh consecutive constructors title at Imola today, which is hosting its first race in 14 years. Britain's Derek Chisora was beaten unanimously on points by Alexander Usyk in their heavyweight bout in London last night. And victory means that Usyk remains the mandatory challenger for Anthony Joshua's WBO title. He, incidentally, was watching ringside. And despite going toe-to-toe -to -toe for 12 rounds in the ring, Chisora and Usyk shared a post-match takeaway after the fight. I would imagine after all that grilled fish and chicken and all those weeks of training, that burger will have tasted good. <laughs> yeah, good in any circumstances, but particularly good Definitely. after that kind of regime. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Um, right, 7.47 now. We're going to uh, talk about the other big story of, of the day, of the weekend, really, in addition to all the coronavirus uh, uh, lockdowns and rules across the UK. And that's the death of Sir Sean Connery. We're going to uh, reflect on his life, his work and his passing at the age of 90 was announced yesterday. In a moment, we'll speak to two actors who knew him well. But first, let's take a moment to look back at, it, at his extraordinary career. Bond. James Bond. The Martini Shaker Monster. Don't let's try and stick the nail again. Here is your next witticism carefully, Mr. Bond. It may be your life. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Looking for shells? No, I'm just looking. ashamed for getting you killed instead of going home rich like you deserve to on account of me being so bleeding high and mighty can you forgive me when you get Capone here's how you get him he pulls a knife you pull a gun he sends one of yours to the hospital you send one of his to the morgue that's the Chicago and that's how you get Capone he's the idol of every woman what are you Capone oh, yours I'm delighted to say we're joined now by Valerie Leon, who starred alongside Sir Sean in Never Say Never Again, and also by the actor Brian Cox, who's in New York and has stayed up into the wee hours there to speak with us as well. Thank you so much to both of you. Brian Cox, you knew him well, but I guess, like many of us, you grew up watching him as, as an actor in films and the movies. Yeah, I mean, the thing about Sean, is I, I didn't know Sean well. I mean, I, I, Sean was very... One was in awe of Sean. It was very hard to kind of... You know, I, I met him on several occasions, but he was, I was always in awe of him. And actually, he made me quite speechless because he was quite, he could be quite taciturn. You know, he had that sort of Edinburgh thing, that way of speaking and that sort of thing that he had. And it was very, it was kind of, <laughs> you know, he felt, wow. <laughs> but the thing about Sean, for, particularly for the people of Scotland, was he's such an icon because he represented a kind of, a sort of now a kind of an independent uh, man, you know, because of he, because he it happened in the beginning 60s and late 50s. And uh, I think he's going to be, of course he's going to be missed, there's no question about that, but he, he represented so much and he meant so much, particularly to the people of my country. And, and Valerie, you obviously uh, appeared in, in a Bond film with him. Um, while you speak, we'll, we'll show a clip of it, I think, but uh, in Never Say Never Again. What was he like to work with? Um, well, first of all, it was a privilege to work with him and, um, and very special, really, because he hadn't played Bond for 12 years and to come back and do Never Say Never Again and, and to be with him. I, I, in fact, my girlfriend thought it was the best move of my career, um, particularly as I had a bed scene with him as well. Um, <laughs> But he, he, he was an extraordinary man, uh, very much a perfectionist, and um, yeah, he was, and he, and he had this animal magnetism as well, you know. Fantastically he, handsome man, wasn't he? Yes, he was, he was, he, he really was. Um, it was fantastic. And, uh, well, I suppose he was one of uh, Scotland's best exports, really, when you come to think about it. 
Brian, tell us a bit about his, his background, his upbringing, because a lot of people may have read in, in the obituaries over the weekend, he, he came from Fountain Bridge in Edinburgh, you mentioned, um, and famously a milkman before becoming an actor and competed for um, Mr Universe, but I didn't realise he was also a coffin polisher. Oh yeah, he worked for St Cuthbert's, and for St Cuthbert's you did everything. You, you delivered the milk, you polished the coffins, you, were, you know, he was a general factotum. Um, uh, they, they used to say about Sean uh, that Sean isn't Edinburgh. He's not just Edinburgh. He's Fountain Bridge. He's pure Fountain Bridge, and that had never left him. You know, his roots. He always acknowledged his roots. He was very faithful to his roots, Sean, and that was the thing that made him so unique. And that's why people, uh, that's why people identified with him and, and saw him as a kind of icon because he did represent sort of what working class men of Scotland who made it good. Okay. And the other thing about Sean that people forget is that he had a range, I mean, James Bond was of course the icing on the cake, but he had played so many roles in television. I mean, I as a kid remember seeing him in The Age of Kings, which was a television series in which he played Hotspur, and uh, also uh, his debut, well, his big role that he had, he took over from Jack Palance in The Requiem for a Heavyweight, and this was all before James Bond. And, and the other thing is, the other work that Sean did, I mean, his... His, his acting was incredibly good. I mean, he really was a marvellous actor, protect, particularly when I think of um, uh, the, the Man Who Would Be King. It's a wonderful performance. Or, or The Hill, which is my favourite Sean performance. And, and, and you, you, you say, Brian, such a, such a talented actor, but he wasn't trained as an actor, was he? It's just, it's no, just obviously a skill he had. That was the other great thing about him. He he did not come from the he did not come by the usual paths, but he was still a, a tremendous autodidact. You know, he wanted to learn everything. He wanted to study Shakespeare. He 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 even got as far as he got so involved. For, for instance, after uh, Goldfinger, he uh, he had to he he, he absolutely he, apparently it's, he took LSD because he was under such stress. And uh, he would, uh, there was a famous Scott psychiatrist called Ronnie Lang, and Ronnie Lang gave him a tab of LSD, and of course he t apparently had a very bad reaction to him. But uh, did, it did deal with his stress. <laughs> well, he certainly lived the life, didn't he? And became such a strong voice for the cause for Scottish independence. Although some, some people were sort of slightly critical of that, given that he uh, based himself outside of, of Scotland for uh, the greater part of his... Uh, later years. Do you think that well, weakened his I, argument? No, I don't think so at all. I mean, I think, you know, uh, there's a song called My Hearts and the Healings, and the fact is it doesn't leave. I mean, I I grow, I mean, even though I live, uh, again, the way though I, sp I spend a lot of time back in Scotland, but I, 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 it means more to me the older I get. And I think it was, I think Sean had every reason to, yeah, I think he was, he at one time was certainly thinking of settling back in Scotland. But I think it was difficult for him because he was so well known. It would be very difficult for him to keep his uh, uh, privacy, you know. And he was also quite a private man, so that would be doubly hard if he was living in in, in Scotland. And also, it's a, it was a different time, you know. He uh, he represented, as I say, he represented so much for people that uh, I, I think it was hard for him to kind of, you know, that he couldn't be there all the time. And he did spend more. He did because he liked to golf, so he spent quite a lot of time in Scotland. So it's a little, I think it's a little unfair, and also to do with the fact that he uh, he was international, so he did travel a great deal. So he chose, and he liked to golf, so first he lived in Malaga, and then, then he ended up living in the Bahamas. So I, 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 I don't think that's fair about us, because he was always, he was a great ambassador for Scotland. There was no question about that. He always, put, and he was very clear, there's a, Marvellous film, a documentary film that he made called uh, uh, the, the Bowler and the Bonnet, which he made in the 60s, which is a really interest about the, about the shipyards. And he was very much working class. He was very much of that. You know, that's where he came from, and he always acknowledged that. And that's, that's what made him, I think, actually quite considerable. And, and Valerie, you, you had a, a unique um, insight into the, the, the James Bond role because you also appeared alongside... Roger Moore, uh, when he was, was playing Bond, and it's, it's that age-old debate, isn't it, about who is the best Bond, but I think a recent poll said Sean Connery was, was the archetypal Bond. 
Sean Connery is definitely the definitive Bond. I mean, Sean really made Bond, and Bond, of course, made Sean incredibly famous. Although he was he, he was such a wonderful actor in every other respect. I mean, it really made him so famous. Uh, but you know, he he didn't really care for that fame so much uh, because you know he, I I was in the Bahamas when we did Never Say Never Again. And he was always being disturbed by fans, um, which he didn't care for at all, really. He didn't have much patience for them. Um, but, I mean, I mean, what a life and what a career. I mean, he made some wonderful films, in addition to all the Bond films he made. And you, you mentioned that he was a perfectionist. Um, how did yeah. that manifest itself on set? Well, everything had to be just right. I think there were uh, several problems with Never Say Never Again, and there was... And there was a slight atmosphere maybe at the time. Um, I mean, we're going back to 1983, it's a long time ago. Uh, but, um, yeah, he, he was a perfectionist. And when people used to say, who did you prefer, Sean or Roger? I would always say, well, Roger was a lot of fun and very jokey. Sean was the perfectionist and liked things to be just right, you know. But, but, but Roger was always messing around and doing totally unscripted things, which would never happen with Sean. And Brian, he never actually lost, you talk about almost being intimidated by him, he never lost that physical presence that he started out with in, in his early career. No, he was huge. I mean, he walked into a room and you went, you know, you literally, you, you create, he created space around him because he was such, such, he had such presence. I mean, he really did. It was a phenomenal. I mean, I, I remember the first time I saw him, the first time I met him was at one of the Edinburgh Film Festivals. And I was just, my jaw was like, wow, because he was just, <laughs> Sort of astonishing in his, in his kind of masculinity, you know, but not, but very quiet. And I, and, and I think that what well, Valerie says is right. He had this perfectionism about him. There was a, apparently he, was, he had this thing called the four minute rule. He said, I'm not, I don't, if I don't get to the set, if it doesn't start in four minutes, I'm going back to my dressing room. <laughs> and he was quite, he was quite tough in that way. And I think in this business, you have to be, you know. Brian, thank you so much for talking to us, and we are really, really grateful to you for staying up so late in New York to, uh, to talk to us. Given that it is that time, Brian, you can justify raising a single malt to him over there. You can't quite do absolutely, it here at this time. Absolutely. Thank you, and, uh, and thank you also to uh, Valerie Leon for uh, sharing her memories of the great uh, Sir Sean Connery. So goodbye to viewers. For now on BBC One, we're going to be on the News Channel until nine. Bye-bye, have a good day. Something's happened here. Where is everyone? I'm afraid.